Our guests today are Scott Kimple and Olga Kavatskaya. Scott is a partner of Hunt and Andrews Kurth here in Washington, D.C. He used to work at the SEC as a counselor to Commissioner Troy Paredes. Scott is one of those go-to people for me. He seems to know everything about the securities law and corporate law. Olga is Assistant General Counsel and Assistant Corporate Secretary at Philip Morris International in Switzerland. Very excited to have Olga. I'm Brock Romanek today on Zippy Point. Okay, let's talk about known trends and uncertainties. Ah, known trends and uncertainties. So when I'm in the staff in the late 80s and an interpretive release came out, this is really what the SEC was driving at, trying to get more forward-looking information in the SEC filings, which of course, this is the kind of information that investors most want. And of course, this is also the kind of disclosure companies least want to give. So you'll be discussing known trends and uncertainties quite a bit in your MDNA. It's a requirement that really gets you thinking. Different people in your company are going to have different thoughts about what you should be disclosing. So if you have colleagues that are hesitant to disclose any known trends and uncertainties, just point them out to some of the SEC enforcement actions brought over the years. Because hindsight is twenty twenty, and so it's easy for the SEC enforcement division to to say, hey, do you have evidence that you knew about this trend? Of course, yes. Then <laughs> why didn't you disclose it? Because it happened and it was not good news and the stock price went way down. You know, hindsight is 2020, but you need to have valid reasons why you didn't know about a known trend. You can't be ignorant that you should have known. And so you got to train your business people to bubble up trends to the attention, at least the more senior people, people on your disclosure committee, so that when you get together in a drafting session, someone mentions, hey, maybe shouldn't we mention, shouldn't we disclose something about this? And you're like, oh, I didn't know about that. We should put that in. All right. So how do you think about all this from a regulatory standpoint? The SEC has set forth a two-step analysis of, a, of determining when known trends and uncertainties must be disclosed. That analysis was in the 1989 release, and you can read it here. This analysis differs from a traditional materiality analysis. It's a lower disclosure threshold. So number one, is a known trend likely to come to fruition? If management determines that it is not reasonably likely to occur, no disclosure is required. Not reasonably likely to occur. That's a key term here. And number two, if management can't make that determination, it must evaluate the consequences. And then disclosure is then required unless management determines that a material effect on the company's financial condition results of operations is not reasonably likely to occur. So we have that the term of art that we have to consider. Like I said, this is not the same analysis you do for your materiality analysis. This reasonably likely to occur test is not the same as a probability magnitude materiality test in Basic v. Levinson, that U.S. Supreme Court case from the late 80s. The SEC has repeatedly said that. So why is making this disclosure so hard? Like I said, this is forward-looking disclosure, and if, and anytime you have forward-looking disclosure, you worry about getting sued if you're wrong. You worry about turning your disclosure into a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's really hard to get the company to put themselves out there. And you should also be worried about the duty to update. So this is a, a real hassle. You have to really be careful how you couch this disclosure so you're, you're not tagged with a duty to update where you're continuing to have to revisit the disclosure every quarter in your 10Q. This is a definitely a good area where you want to see what your competitors are saying, what they're disclosing, what's a known trend for them, should be for you in many cases, at least when it comes to the industry stuff. And then there's the known trends that many companies have are universally facing, the kinds that are so important that the SEC puts out their interpretive guidance just in that area. So these days it's uh, climate change, cybersecurity, and of course, COVID-19. So Olga, the heart of the heart, the how hard is it to determine your known trends and uncertainties? This is the SEC's attempt to get some forward-looking information in the company's SEC filing stream. How do you determine that? How do you know when to stop? Right. Good question. Short answer is it's kind of hard. Um, you start with the legal determination analysis that the SEC gives you, um, but, but it, it's hard. It's a two-step process. You determine if something is um, likely to occur, and if you can't conclude it's not likely, you need to then move on to the next step and then you disclose it unless it's immaterial. But before you get to 
uh, before you get to the legal analysis, you need to understand what your inventory of risks and uncertainties and trends, uh, what that inventory looks like. So you can imagine that the inventory is quite vast. You have your tobacco re regulation that everybody understands kind of what it is and it just it evolves still but you you have your regular um, excise taxation restrictions and advertising and so forth but then you have um, an ocean of other regulations um, and we can think of regulations regulatory uncertainty as a as a, an uncertainty or as a trend in itself so we describe it, we try to be quite transparent with our investors and what we know, what we don't know, what we'd like to know, where we'd like to wind up. And when you talk to management to understand their perspective, it's very important to break it up in, in various elements, uh, hopefully the same way they, they think of these elements. So for example, we say publicly, and we say it in the 10Q as well, that for us to be successful, we are advocating for a regulatory regime that differentiates between cigarettes and our reduced risk products. Well, we also say we have various challenges. We, we name what they are, but we also say quite transparently, we can't guarantee that we will achieve what we are asking, what we are advocating for. Um, so we, and we track and we're quite diligent at talking with our corporate affairs colleagues who can provide us with input on where, are, where we are each quarter in these regulatory developments. And it, it's a tedious exercise, it's also quite refreshing because you get into the nitty gritty of what they're thinking, what they should be thinking, what you're thinking, what the SEC could be thinking in the end after they read it. And ultimately, is it helpful to the investors to understand what it is that we're telling them so it is a very hard exercise. Um, when we're talking about regulation, and I've, I've had this issue when I was in private practice, and it's to your point, Brock, where do you stop? If you have a proposed regulation, if you have a kind of a proposed regulation, where on the spectrum do you see these uncertainties and do you uh, put them in, the, in your thank you? So we are a multinational company. Um, all over the globe, regulatory developments have different trajectories. And you, you can't just assume that it's the same system as in the United States where a bill goes through various stages that we all learned in school. It, it's a completely um, different regime country by country and you do need to get into the weeds. Where is this regulation? But we, for example, disclose even regulation that is proposed if we see it's a trend. An example of that is plain packaging. So for, for a pack of cigarettes in a, in a specific country, there was a regulation that was passed that we, we could not put our brand, um, our brand names or logos or identifying uh, IP on our, on our packs. And of course, it's, it's a negative for the company. And of course, we disclose that. But then you have proposed regulation of a similar nature in different other countries. And you don't know and you can't gauge where this regulation will wind up. It's proposed. It needs a, an equivalent of a Senate or parliament or sometimes president or king of a country to actually enact this regulation. Well, do you disclose it? So for us, we decided to disclose it because it, it's, a, it's an unfavorable, call it a trend or development all over the globe. Um, it, it's, it's obviously unfavorable. Is it material? Could be material if it's enacted. So under this two-step analysis, you would disclose it, but you probably even mind, in the absence of the analysis, you probably would also disclose it because it's kind of a trend and it's not in your favor, obviously. So you can't distinguish your brands. So that's an example of you don't stop. You keep going and you analyze and you probably would disclose. Um, 
Another thing we are struggling with, and in private practice, our other clients were struggling with the distinction between a risk factor disclosure and MDNA disclosure. And sometimes they feed off of each other. You see cross-references. They're very elegantly done. But what I um, always remind others and myself, principally, is that MDNA disclosure is not a risk factor disclosure. We're talking about known trends. Risk factor disclosure is crafted as a hypothetical. It's if X, then then, then Y. It's crafted as a maybe something will happen. Uh, and here are potential consequences. Here we're talking about known uncertainties. So we need to keep the two separate and distinct. Uh, another interesting practice point I wanted to share is things that are obvious. And that goes back to your question, Brock, and when do you, when do you stop? Do you, do you disclose things that are obvious? And the obvious nature of a factor that you're considering could come from a, a, a fact that it's publicly disclosed or it's public knowledge or everybody gets it. So do you, do you disclose something that's obvious? And the testing of what's obvious for me is, is it really obvious? The first question I ask myself, is it obvious or is it obvious to all of us because we're brewing in the same uh, soup? We're all talking about the same issues, tobacco regulation, new products. Is it only obvious to us or would it be obvious to a regular investor? outside of the company. And here's where your less confidential information, this is where your friends and relatives come handy. So I test my concepts on my kids, on my mother-in-law, PwC sometimes our independent auditor comes in handy because they have this broader perspective that we tend to lose in house. Uh, outside counsel comes in handy to just share a breadth of experience. So this is, this is not an easy one to weed out what's obvious and what's not so obvious. And as we all know, just because something is in public domain doesn't make it, doesn't make it not disclosable. We have, for example, in the, in the regulatory uh, development example I described, all of these regulations proposed not proposed, final, they're all in public domain, but you still need to encapsulate what is it that we're talking, what is management thinking? It's the known trends and uncertainties. We need to convey this information to the investor in this thing queue. 